Archetypes offer a rich symbolic language through which we can define, refine, and understand life experience. I teach a class on archetypes, and I'm very interested in archetypes as a source of creative inspiration. So today I'd like to share with you the images that I've created over the course of my career that relate directly to my understanding and study of archetypes. I highly recommend this as a very rich resource for anyone who's interested in working in a series and using their own life experience and own uh, sensibility to create work that's distinctive. Before I begin with the actual presentation, I'd like you to consider the possibility that 12 archetypes act in tandem to navigate the activities of your days and have the power to shape your creative life. You can determine which archetypes are at work in your life by reading archetypal profiles and choosing eight that feel like a good fit. You choose eight because there are four in the context of the theory that I follow that are survival archetypes, and these have been uh, documented in lots of different theorists' uh, studies. Um, they're basically the survival archetypes of the prostitute, the victim, the child, and the saboteur. So as human beings, we all have those four archetypes in common, and then we have eight that we can select ourselves based on what resonates with us back to the very earliest memories that we have. Once an archetypal team is recognized, it can play a pivotal role in your studio life. It can inspire projects and unravel the blocks that shut down active creating. Aligning with your archetypal team means that you're never alone. Uninitiated may scoff and refer to them as your imaginary friends, but they don't really understand the power, and they should really stop and think and choose their own aid if, if, if I'd have anything to say about it. Because once archetypes are understood symbolically, you can value this approach to creativity, and then you'll wish that everyone could speak this symbolic language. Let me give you just an example of a case study. I had a student, this is a long time ago, whose name was Jimmy. He attended one of my workshops, and he was charged with reading about the archetypes and selecting his team. And people didn't have to share their archetypes with each other, but typically I meet with a student and we talk about the archetypes that have been selected. He chose the indentured servant as one of his eight and he defended the choice by explaining to me that in his regular life, when he wasn't at a workshop, he was a caregiver for an elderly uncle and aunt. They had fostered him after his parents were killed in an accident when he was a young boy. He was sure his aunt and uncle would disown him if they discovered that he was gay. So he'd made the conscious decision not to reveal his homosexuality publicly until the relatives died. In the meantime, he was paying a price, and the only time he could really be himself was in visits to Mardi Gras in New Orleans or in a class like the one he took with me. He chose the indentured servant because he felt he was literally buying his freedom by caring for his elderly relatives until their lives ended. Their deaths meant his freedom in both a literal and a figurative sense. He didn't resent the caretaking, but he anticipated the freedom that would eventually be his. In addition to the indentured servant, Jimmy chose the hedonist as part of his archetypal team. The hedonist was the part of his personality that loved the sensual, the colorful, and the daring. At the time of the workshop, he couldn't explore the hedonist openly, but it did inspire vibrant, very colorful artwork. So these two archetypes, the indentured servant and the hedonist, allowed Jimmy to understand and express his unique story. It helped him put the events of his life in context. He found comfort in this new archetypal understanding, and it energized him to work with his reality, anticipating his freedom while he made symbolic, colorful, colorful art quilts in the meantime. I think it's important to understand that archetypes aren't actually living things. They're not angels or creatures at all. They represent a language that we can use to identify or name fears and motivations. It's also important to recognize that any discussion of archetypes is basically one about two sides. Every archetype has two sides. Almost everything in life, as far as I can tell, has two sides. Two sides to every story, right? 
Archetypes are inherently neutral, that is, they're not good or bad. And it's important to understand this before you start casting your chart or choosing the archetypes that you might work with, because you can be very put off by the name of an archetype because you associate it with a negative thing, when in fact it has positive lessons to teach. So let's look at a few of the pieces that I've created in order to explore my archetypes further. This piece goes back to 1997. I have a very strong rebel. The positive part of the rebel is the part that uh, is willing to jump in and explore and stand up for herself. The darker or shadow side of the rebel is the rebel without a cause or a rebel that's destructive in some way. And in this case, it's, this is a collage of handmade papers and photocopy transfers on silk, and the title of it is She Was Willing to Do Anything to Avoid Commitment. And it's about 18 by 24 inches. This is also a piece from that period in time when I was mainly exploring the use of photocopy transfers and how I could cut and paste images together and juxtapose them in interesting ways. Um, I have a large damsel, and the damsel has frequently been in distress. And the, the, that's the, the downside of the damsel, is to feel as though somebody always has to rescue you. In this case, my damsel has gradually evolved over time with maturity into a benevolent queen who wants to care for her village or her people or her tribe. But this piece was when I was still exploring the damsel and feeling a lot of pain around it. And so you can see the, the, the sandpaper and the pins that are inserted into the fabric along with this Venus de Milo with a, a Betty Grable head. As we work in, in the series that we can create as artists or in the, the sort of uh, visual language that we're trying to establish as artists, many of the elements that we use can be symbolic and help tell part of the story. And so in this case, the sandpaper and the roughness of that, the tea towels that were used for this piece and the pins that were inserted all have some symbolic meaning for me as do the burned edges that I used at this point in time on a lot of my work. I have a strong judge, and in 1998, I also chose the kingfisher as my familiar. A familiar is a bird or an animal that resonates with us and has some symbolic meaning. And I saw kingfishers everywhere I went. So I looked up the kingfisher, and what I discovered is that the kingfisher is a sign of wisdom in many ancient cultures. And so I began to work with the kingfisher as, my, as a design element, as a focal point in some of my work. This piece is about uh, 36 by 24, so maybe a little bit bigger than that. A collage incorporating photocopy transfers and quilting uh, and mixed media, including the sticks on the surface. As a feminist, I've been very concerned all of my life about fairness, that's my judge, coming out and wanting the treatment of women to be more fair than it has sometimes been. Um, this piece from 1994 is also an expression of my victim, how I felt as a woman who was uh, frequently dismissed and belittled. Um, this was a body print that I actually did by painting myself with black paint and laying down on a a bed sheet in order to make the impression. And when I started to lay down, here I am covered with black paint, I started to lay down on the sheet and I realized I was too big for the sheet. So that turned into this rather contorted pose and it reminded me immediately of how victimized women can feel because my daughter made a print, she was seven at the time, and she fit on the sheet so her arms were raised up in a sort of a victorious motion that's the difference, I suppose, of what aging and encounters with society can do to us. So this is all machine quilted, and around the edges are black photocopies of stones, and there are sticks literally sewn to the surface, and the title of the piece is Sticks and Stones Will Break My Bones, But Words Will Never Hurt Me. And as you can probably see, the writing, which is machine stitching, freehand, um, is all of the words that are used to refer to women in this culture. Sometimes they're kind, and sometimes they're not so kind. Another piece from about that same time. Uh, I love mothering. It changed my life. 
but it was also one of the most challenging and difficult things I've ever encountered. Um, I did not want to be a mother. I had an abortion. And when my daughter was born, I was feeling very challenged about what a single mother would do, how, how I would behave, what, what our interactions would be. Um, and so this piece represents that sort of a spiritual quest, I suppose it was, to discover myself by being in touch with this very strong mother archetype I have that really does want to love and see other people blossom without being overbearing. Uh, this is again a photocopy transfer. This piece is uh, about twin bed size. And the Madonna was an image that I began to use frequently and to explore. Even though I'm a Protestant by birth, um, I am very drawn, as many women are, to these images of uh, Madonnas and goddesses that are also a symbolic language, not unlike of the archetypes. Another piece, again, representing the mother archetype, and this time the fullness and lushness that mothering can be and represent when we're able to embrace it. Uh, this piece has some other symbolic qualities. This is a, a relatively small piece. It's about 12 by 16, and it is installed in a box that's two inches deep, and there is writing around the inside edges, although you can't see that in this photograph. I did start using these small safety pins, each of which had a couple of beads added to it before it was pinned into the surface as a symbolic element relating to women's mundane work and also to the pleasure that little girls had at this particular point in time, making bracelets from um, safety pins like this and putting beads on the safety pin break bracelet that were certain colors that represented certain uh, feelings and emotions and connections with other girls. Lots of handwork here and again a photocopy transfer as the focal point. Another version of the damsel which only goes to show you that these these archetypes are so rich that they can be explored over and over again at different points in time. Um, this is a color transfer on fabrics that are the scraps of some of the most lush, beautiful fabrics that I was making at the time, and a series again of the safety pins and of the elements that represent um, uh, sometimes royalty, sometimes ceremony, bells and metal hearts and stars all of that part of the, the charms, I think, that help a damsel symbolically become the benevolent queen. My interest in the Tao Te Ching and um, Buddhism led me to a new series of elements, including Kuan Yin. It's a very large Kuan Yin in Kansas City in the Nelson Atkins Art Museum and I made pilgrimages during this time several, several times to the museum to see this large Kuan Yin. And the face that you see here is a photograph of the face of the Kuan Yin at the Nelson Atkins Museum. Um, I see these uh, Kuan Yin and Buddha, as well as Christ, as well as, as the Madonna. All of these are symbolic guides. I have a very strong guide myself, stronger than a teacher. A guide wants people to explore what they need to explore in order to further their own development, whereas a teacher imparts knowledge. And so I see my career as being more that of the guide. And the guide crosses rivers. The Native American guides crossed rivers and rode up onto a hilltop looking ahead to see what was ahead in order to move the entire tribe from one safe location to another. And so smoke rings became an important element when I was thinking about my guide, as did rocks and stones. Another piece, again, a version of the guide that is even more abstracted. On the left, the panel has a series of maps that have been printed in thick and dye. Um, and then you see the smoke rings, which are needle felted, uh, up through the right third of the piece. And I've used flower paste to create a surface that I could write into on the silk fabric. And so the words on the right are words that have to do with my understanding of the guide as the archetype guides me and leads me forward in the work that I do with other people.
I've revisited the judge, this time in a more abstract way, and also have combined it with the guide because there are my rings again. And that strong, the colors, there it, it's such a rich language. You know, you could look at a color wheel and decide for yourself what each of the colors on a color wheel means to you symbolically, and then you can use those colors to support your work. And so that is another exercise I highly recommend, and that's where this really deep, deep burgundy and green came from in the free associations that I did color-wise related to the judge. This particular series had elements that repeated, which is one of the things that we can do in order to tie work together. And so here's the gambler. And the gambler is represented with a whole different set of colors and more vibrant and more interactive, in a sense, visually. And then in that flower pasted piece on the right, there were lots of marks that had to do with running risks and taking risks and writing about risks. And there is a song by Mary Chapin Carpenter, and one of the lines is, cut the deck right in half, I'll play from either side. And so the, the orange line that has dissected this piece was actually a tribute to the line in that song by Mary Chapin Carpenter. Because that song is so much about gambling from the emotional and spiritual perspective. I have a nature child, and there are a number of different child archetypes. There's a wounded child, there's a nature child, there's a magical child, and sometimes they overlap. When you're looking at your archetypal chart, you don't ever have to select one and, and feel as though it's that one and only thing. And so if you have a nature child, you probably have a little bit of magical child rolled into, into it. And so the colors reflect the nature child here, as does the imagery with the hummingbird. Another version of the nature child, this time with needle felting and these uh, black felt silhouettes against that bright, beautiful color that I was really inspired by the color in the dye work to think about what the sunlight looks like when it's dappling down through the trees. And it's that's got a magical quality as well as being um, the best of nature, doesn't it? Another version of the mother, this time, a beautiful abstract background, and then the line of the, the, the female body is a needle, needle felted using black roving. And you can see the cross stitching <clears throat> that binds the two, the small left piece on the right to the larger piece, or sorry, the, the small piece on the left to the larger piece on the right, and that sort of stitching, those are the sutures that mothers use over and over again in uh, perhaps symbolic ways to put little children back together with band-aids when needed and to bind up the wounds of their own psyches based on the events of motherhood. It can go lots of different directions. The saboteur, this piece pretty much directly inspired by the story of Adam and Eve and the snake in the garden in Genesis. Um, the colors are representative, and the apples and the snake are all needle felted. This piece was about 84 inches tall. Yet another version of the Kingfisher and the Judge, quite different from that earlier rendition, but an element that continues to resonate with me. I still see a Kingfisher on the creek over the creek near where I live, and I've seen a kingfisher there for over 30 years. I looked them up, and kingfishers can actually live 30 years. So here we have a combination of the writing into the flower paste with the words that I free associated to the judge, the judge is fair, the judge is open, the judge is determined, open-minded, listens, etc. And the rebel, represented mainly by the broad marks in the flower paste on the right, the colors of the needle felding, and then the writing on the left, which was the mantra that I was using at the time that these pieces were created. And from a technical standpoint, the panel on the left is white vinyl. And if you paint paint, paint onto vinyl, 
you have enough time to use a skewer to write or draw into the paint on the vinyl, which is how this was created. So it's a, it's a material that we don't usually think about using, but it has some uh, possibilities that are fun to explore. This piece was created for a show in the UK. And this is again the nature child and I literally borrowed two children and painted them up not unlike that victim piece that I had done earlier in my career. Uh, we did this on a hot July day. The kids printed themselves for me and then they went outside and hosed off and had popsicles. So it was a win-win. This piece is called uh, A Prayer for the Children and the Flowers. And it's life size. All the flowers are photocopy transfers that have been hand colored with um, watercolor paint. One more guide. There is the map again, this time translated onto the surface using black sand. And the bird is a photocopy transfer that was hand colored with colored pencil. About uh, this piece is about 30 by 38. I became very interested in using spoon flour to create lengths of cloth. In 2011, I did an entire series based on spoon flour fabrics that I had created for my own photographs. And although the series was actually a series that was recognizing the sacred planet, and you can see those pieces still on my website if you're interested in looking at the sacred planet, uh, this particular piece resonated really as a nature child piece as much as it had to do with the uh, the, the birds and the butterflies. Another nature child piece inspired by that series. If you look closely, this is a combination of dahlias put into a repeat pattern. And then on the right, tigers from a glass case in a museum in Perth, Australia, where they literally seem to be disappearing into thin air because of how the photographs were taken. And yet another piece which is exploring and honoring uh, the natural world and the fact that we sometimes are not nearly as careful in uh, caring for it as we could be. And of course the outcome after doing 14 pieces in the series that that were honoring, um, it did occur to me that, that there wasn't any any representation of what we do to degrade the planet. And so I put this piece that had been completed on the floor, stood on a ladder, and poured the paint from about eight feet up in order to create the marks that are the scars um, representative of all the things that we do that, that dishonor the world around us instead of honoring it. I hope you have enjoyed looking at these works and thinking about archetypes if the idea is new for you. If it's not so new, I hope this has given you a little bit of a different perspective on how archetypes can be used. And if you are interested in, in working with archetypes, send me some pictures. Let me know what you've discovered yourself. And if you're interested in studying archetypes with me, uh, stay tuned on my website because we study archetypes consistently in the creative strength training program but i'm also working on a book and i do teach this as a class around the country occasionally that would always be listed on my calendar thanks for being here